and welcome to today's program mm -hmm. titled Pediatric Emergency Preparedness and Virtual Reality. My name is Melanie Blackman, and I'm the strategy editor for Health Leaders and your moderator for today's event. Our program will be 60 minutes in length. Note that an on-demand version of this program will be available approximately one day after the completion of the event and can be accessed using the same login link that you used for the live program. Today's program is sponsored by Health Scholars. Thank you to our sponsor and to you and our audience for giving us your time and attention. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping details. To ensure that you can see all the content for the event, Please maximize your event window and be sure to adjust your computer volume settings and or PC speakers for optimal sound quality. Second, you will find today's presentation and other resources to interact with as downloadable items in the resources list. The resources list is in the upper right corner of your console player. Next, at the bottom of your console are multiple widgets you can use. To submit a question, click on the Q&A widget. It may be open already and appear on the left side of your screen. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. However, please note that it is likely that your question will not be answered until the Q&A portion of the program. Finally, should you experience any technical difficulties during today's program and need assistance, please click on the help widget, which has a question mark icon and cover common technical issues. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jana Patterson, Senior Vice President of Global Child Health and Life Support of American Academy of Pediatrics, Dr. Mike McAvoy, CMS Coordinator for Saratoga County, New York, and Cardiovascular ICU Nurse Clinician of Albany Medical Center, and Brian, uh, Dr. Brian Gillette, Chief Medical Officer of Health Scholars. Thank you all for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, the audience is yours. Thank you so much, Melanie. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session on Pediatric Emergency Preparedness and Virtual Reality. It's my pleasure to host you here today along with Mike and Brian, and we look forward to a robust discussion with all of you. So we're going to start off with a poll because I really want to know how many of you out there have experienced virtual reality or VR, of course, as we call it for short. Never? Briefly? Uh, yes, I own VR. Or yes, I've trained in VR. So I'll give you a few seconds here to join the poll, click your answer, and we'll see what the experience is of the audience. We're up to a quarter of you responding. We'll give it a few more seconds and see if we can get a few more. Okay, let's see what we got. So many of you have never experienced VR, about a third of you, half have had a brief encounter, and then a few of you are experts, 15% or so, uh, who own VR or have trained in VR. So it's great to know that we've got some experienced folks with us today, but also really excited to be able to talk about this new technology with many of you who have had just a little bit of exposure. So before we keep going, I, you already heard, I'm Jana Patterson, and I lead the Global Health and Life Support Team at the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I have two specialists with me here today, Mike and Brian, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their background. Brian, over to you. Sure. Thank you, Jana. 
Um, again, I'm Brian Gillette. I'm an emergency medicine physician and longtime simulation educationalist. Uh, I serve as the chief medical officer at Health Scholars. Mike? Thanks. Uh, so I'm Mike McAvoy. Uh, I'm the EMS coordinator for uh, Saratoga County, New York, about uh, 150 miles north of New York City, um, and work also in the cardiovascular uh, surgical ICUs, both an adult uh, ICU and a pediatric um, cardiovascular uh, surgical ICU at the Albany Medical Center in uh, New York. Thanks, gentlemen. So today we want to chat a little bit about how VR is being leveraged to decrease training costs, increase scalability, and improve competency across pediatric emergency training. We also want to get some reactions and feedback on VR training from the field, and also then finally talk about how to integrate VR training and best practices to get started. So first up, VR efficiency and effectiveness. So we know that VR is cost effective and, and provides an opportunity to deliver at scale. But did you know that it costs 83% less than traditional training modalities? So of course it requires fewer resources. I think we may have lost Jana's volume. You know, while we while we work on uh, Jana's volume, I can add a little color to this slide. Can can the audience hear me? Um, Mike and Jenna, can you hear me? Okay. All right. Great. Well, let me um, just add a little color here while we're working on getting Jenna's um, volume back. So the, the cost um, point is, is really interesting. There has been a number of studies that have uh, looked at mannequin-based simulation from a cost utility um, perspective. Henry Levin, um, an economist out of Columbia University, developed the framework with which most of us in the industry apply in, in identifying educational program costs. Um, in general, a, the cost per learner for a mannequin-based, traditional one-hour mannequin-based simulation session it ranges between 190 to 260 dollars um, across the literature. Mount Sinai did a study uh, about a year and a half ago that looked at efficacy and costs of VR against a uh, mannequin paradigm for ACLS training, and found that VR costs were approximately. Ninety dollars um, per learner, as compared to one hundred and ninety in their study, and we'll see the mannequin-based paradigm as high as two hundred and sixty per learner when you account when it's fully loaded and you account for backfilling time um, for travel, all the resources that stand up a, um, a mannequin paradigm. So, um, the r really interesting point there, and it certainly. <laughs> There's an economy of scale that we see with VR. Great. Thanks, Brian. How about you, Mike? What do you think about VR efficiency and effectiveness? Uh, I can see exactly why uh, it's cheaper. I mean, I think one of the things that we know with uh, simulation is that you have to have an operator to run the equipment in order to have the, the person use it. And I think like in a pre-hospital environment where I am, 
uh, VR offers a uh, few things that that are uh, not only cost savings, but make it easier for the user to actually utilize the technology. One is that you can take the VR off and put it back on, start right back where you were when you need to go to a call. So uh, it's difficult to stop a simulation, go out and answer an ambulance call, come back and pick up where you left off. So I think it's from a perspective of ease of use and the number of people that are involved, it's almost um, learner driven when you look at the way that VR works as opposed to simulation where you really need a team to put something like that together. So I, I could see a lot of advantages when you compare the VR to the simulation model of training. Thanks, Mike. So they say experience matters. Well, what I think this means is really that you need to be able to practice things before you're in a situation where you really have to use it. And we all know that pediatric emergencies tend to be a more rare event than adult emergencies. But I'd love to hear some of your experiences from the field and how VR has impacted your comfort level with attending to pediatric emergencies. Why don't we go to you first, Mike? Well, I would have to say uh, in the EMS world, and it's, it's probably not much different uh, in the rest of medical uh, practice, that kids are one of the things that frighten us the most and one of the encounters that we have the least. And in the emergency uh, medical field, things that you have the least experience with oftentimes are the most challenging sorts of calls that you could encounter. And one of the great things about VR is it gives you some confidence in what you're doing. You're able to manage a patient and watch the results of that. You can observe some things that you only read about in textbooks, but now you're actually seeing it right in front of your eyes, literally, and able to treat uh, a child or an infant and learn from that experience so that you gain confidence in what you're doing. And I think it's interesting because um, pediatrics is one area, obstetrics and gynecology in their um, journal just a couple days ago, uh, published a study that looked at uh, malpractice claims with physicians and noticed that the more frequently they had simulated practice the less their malpractice claims were and the more confident they were in, in treating patients. And I think that that's what I've seen with uh, VR in the pre-hospital world is people feel very uncomfortable, especially with a pediatric subset of patients, become much more confident and feel more capable and perform better when they're actually in the field treating pediatric emergencies because they've had the experience of, of doing it with VR. Yeah, I think that's really important. I know, Brian, that you work in an ER, and um, it's an ER that sees both adults and kids. And so tell me a little bit about what it's like in a hospital setting. Oh, sure. There, there's nothing like seeing a crashing infant to raise the hair on the arms of any emergency medicine provider. Um, we... So we see a, a significant volume of adult uh, critical patients. Thank goodness uh, we do not see the, the same numbers in, in, with children, and, and particularly infants and toddlers. That said, it is um, extremely anxiety-provoking. Um, I, I am sort of preaching to the choir here because I um, am a I've been making the Kool-Aid long ago with regard to immersive education and training, but I can speak to a very specific situation that occurred just a few months ago that I was relating to our team over at Health Scholars. I was um, on an overnight shift, and we've been seeing a lot of um, increased respiratory failures recently in, in infants and toddlers from COVID. And there was a child who was in respiratory failure, um, ended up having a pneumothorax. This was an infant. Um, the parents were there. And fortunately, we had just been developing a pediatric emergency care application. And so this, this 
stuff was just, you know, right on my frontal cortex. And I felt as if I had had just seen this case in VR. So um, it was great to be able to relate back to, the, to, the, to our company that, hey, you know, I, I know we all believe in this stuff, but it actually is real, right? Like I actually um, felt I had the confidence uh, to stay calm and to be able to just execute with the team to care for this child. So yeah, I can really speak to that from a, from a personal perspective as well as from an educational perspective. Yeah, thanks, Brian. You know, even though I'm a trained neonatologist, I certainly got that little clench in the pit of my stomach sometimes too when I had to go to an emergency. And I think any time that you have different ways that you can practice before the, the real event happens, um, it, it just benefits kids all around. Yeah, no, absolutely. Hey, Jenna, um, I wonder yeah. if if we flip back a couple slides, I, I'm almost wondering if we really uh, delved into the VR efficiency and effectiveness as much as, as we wanted to. Were there other points on that, that prior slide that we wanted to cover? Okay. Uh, you had talked a little bit about differences in costs, and, and I don't know if there were other things that um, you or Brian wanted to, to talk about with that. I know one thing that I find um, in a pre-hospital world is that when you talk about VR, uh, that's very intuitive to the age group that's often practicing. Um, they have Oculus headsets, they play VR games. Uh, it's a type of training, it's a modality that's very familiar to people. Uh, and all of us who have worked with simulation know that, boy, there's a big uphill curve when you're trying to implement simulation anywhere, really trying to learn how to run the machine. Um, so I, I see that as like um, something that when we talk about this slide with efficiency and effectiveness, um, generationally, I think uh, VR is something that sometimes is an easier type of modality to slide into, especially in the pre-hospital world. I think that's a great, that's, that's a really important point to discuss. I can, I can speak a bit to this on the health system side. Um, specifically with regard to, to resources, standing up a simulation for uh, like obstetrical hemorrhage or um, a malignant like a, a operative emergency generally requires about six people in the room. You know, by the time you get everyone in there, you, you've got the tech, you have to have a technician, there's an instructor, then there's these helpers that we used to call confederates to help move the case along. And then you have all of the learners. It's an extremely resource intensive modality, albeit in a, in a highly effective one due to the immersion. However, that is probably the first and foremost benefit of VR with it, such that we can conf it confers all of the benefits that we've seen from simulation in terms of really moving the needle with regard to clinical performance. Uh, we have over a decade of evidence supporting that. And yet we can, can, we can enjoy these benefits sort of in an anytime, anywhere environment without all of that resource to stand up, Mike. So I, I very much agree with that. And I guess one of the things we didn't really talk about as much was this emotional connection. And I think people kind of see that um, statistic and they're like, well, what does that really mean? But I think we all know anytime we've practiced emergencies that when you feel that heart rate go up and your palms get sweaty, you know something's working, like this is a real practice, right? And so I, I really think that when uh, what VR offers in terms of that being in the moment and being connected to what is a real experience is just really so powerful. So why don't we talk about how to bring all these experiences together into a program? When we think about integrating VR training, I mean, there's so much to consider, right? I mean, first of all, VR isn't the perfect answer for everything. So you need to think about, well, what is the training issue or need that you're solving for? What are you hoping for VR to do? 
then you got to think about, okay, is this going to be the only training that somebody gets on this topic, or is it going to be part of something larger where they're going to have a variety of training modalities and this is a supplement? Of course, you got to think about how many people are going to end, you're going to enroll into the training, how often you're going to do it. Also, whether you want people to be able to take the, the training on demand or have it be administered in real time. And then finally, of course, the issue of champions. Um, we all know that new ideas never take off without somebody who's really excited about it and who can express their enthusiasm and, and tell other people. I mean, that's why we're here today, right? Um, we're all champions of VR. We've all been able to experience it and, and see the impact in our lives. But I know that both Brian and Mike, you've used these VR and programs. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your experience doing that. Brian, why don't you go first? Sure. The question of what am I solving for is, is where it all starts. Uh, so I think the, the most important question to ask is, are, is, does this training need immersion? And does it require repeatability? So VR is delivering experience. It's providing the reference experience by which one can practice in a zero fault environment. Within, um, so with that in mind, I really see VR today as being best leveraged as a means to deliver individualized, deliberate practice at scale. So when we need to reach a large learner population with an experience-based training modality, then mannequin-based simulation just doesn't scale appropriately. Whereas the VR can serve as um, interval training for one to practice, step into the, the headset, practice deliberately as many times as needed to develop mastery such that they then are prepared to step back into a simulation center around a mannequin with a team to exercise higher order, like team-based management types of approaches. Um, individualized deliberate practice it, for high stakes, low occurrence encounters is um, ideally suited to virtual reality when trying to reach large learner populations. Only other bit I would add, I'd like to just touch on um, relates to do you see this need as a standalone training? And there are a variety of interesting blended curriculums that some of our clients at Health Scholars have implemented with VR, such that they're delivering screen, like lower, um, you know, I, I guess screen based education that doesn't really require immersion. And then serve, and then using the virtual reality as a capstone to then go apply that practice and the cognitive principles in a real to life environment. Um, lastly, at the end of this continuum, um, one of our clients very interestingly then culminates with, the, with an annual team based uh, management around a mannequin. And so it, it, it integrates very nicely as booster training, also um, individualized deliberate practice, and lastly, to integrate into a blended learning curriculum. Your thoughts, Mike? Yeah, I, I would say uh, much the same. Like, I think there, there, there's a tremendous scalability to uh, VR that you don't really have with other types of training. I mean, you can, even the user can pick and choose uh, pieces that they want to do. Um, I'm thinking of some of the um, scenarios that we have with the, the PEP uh, pre-hospital uh, preparedness for emergency professionals. And you can actually uh, pick a house that you wanna respond to knowing what call type that's gonna be there. And then you could do pieces of that again uh, after you look at a uh, analysis of how you performed, so there's a tremendous uh, scalability there, and and I think scalability also on a bigger picture of saying, you know, are you going to use this as an entire training experience, or are you going to use this as a component of of a larger curriculum, which is is one of the things that that we talked about here. So there's there's tremendous opportunity to. Um, use it in a, in a lot of different situations. And then the problem, you know, to get back to that first question too about what am I solving for, one of our bigger issues um, in the field of distributive learning, um, particularly for EMS, 
has always been, um, is there some sort of a, um, evaluation of how the learner did during this scenario? And even in simulation, sometimes we're, we struggle to figure out a way to effectively deliver feedback to the user. And in VR, that's built in to the system. It's watching so many components um, in a fashion that gives you like an iterator reliability that you just can't get out of having um, a mannequin simulation where depending on who the operator is of that uh, device, you're going to have a different evaluation perhaps than you would with another operator. Yeah. You don't see that with VR because it's very consistently looking at how the user interacts with the scenario and whether they do or don't do things which um which also speaks to like the amazing amount of development that has to go into that if you if you think about how many things you could possibly um do right how many different ways you could say something how many ways you could go down the wrong pathway and uh so the development of that that sort of thing has to be pretty sophisticated when you think about it from that perspective so yeah yeah yeah, you know, I think one of the other really cool things about VR is is that flexibility. And, you know, VR can be used to, to do like a pre-study too before you do another kind of in-person course or something like that. And because it's repeatable, you know, you can do it before you really even know anything about the topic and and kind of see where you're at. And then you can do other additional training and then come back to that same um, modality to see, you know, ha have things changed? You know, how do I feel now? But it also gives people that chance to come back to the same scenario over and over, but also to try a lot of different scenarios. So I think that's one of the really interesting things about VR is that you get to have the same or different experiences repeatedly. You know, to that point, yeah, that point it's, it serves as an excellent competency validation tool. Uh, at, at one of the academic teaching hospitals where I, that I used to work at, we would bring the internal medicine residents through a mannequin-based simulation to, um, you know, confirm competency or validate competency before they would go on the, co you know, rotate through the code team, and that was a very resource-intensive process. So to Mike's point and to yours, Janet, with regard to the flexibility, VR d does serve well as a competency validation tool. And um, I also imagine there's probably a role for reskilling in, in, in EMS, Mike, as, as one may um, need to re-enter work after a prolonged pause. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, and I, I haven't even mentioned this yet, but that's a, um, a niche that I think VR is going to find itself in because we're um, in an evolution right now in um, EMS. Well, similar to medicine in general is talking about how do we maintain competency and how do we assess competency in, in the provider? And continued competency is uh, in the past in EMS been done by saying, oh, why don't you go back every two years uh, and take the exact same courses that you took to become credentialed to begin with. And uh, if you manage to survive sitting in, through those, then uh, we continue to uh, attest to your competency when, in fact, we know that. Uh, not only is it boring and uh, probably doesn't really inspire anyone to learn anything new, but it really is not a good assessment of their ability to think critically. And so in medicine and nursing and EMS, we're really looking for uh, tools to evaluate competency. And VR is not only an educational tool, but it again gives you that uh, same sort of thing I talked about earlier, where the inter-rater reliability of um, a test that you do or your ability to put on a VR uh, set of goggles and look at a scenario and say, oh, I'm going to manage this patient without going through the educational component to show that I know how to do it. And maybe you do know how to do it. And maybe you don't need to have education in that area. Or perhaps 
there's some component of that uh, scenario where you're going to learn something new from this and you may not be uh, as as um, skilled in it as you thought you were. So I think it has, you know, to answer your question about um, your continued assessment, continued competency, this has this tremendous uh, niche in that regard. And to take it one step further, we, we look at people who are coming out of med school, coming out of paramedic programs, coming out of nursing schools, and say, you know, what are we using in the actual educational programs to assess competency in those folks? And here's another niche that this, this sort of technology gives you um, a very inexpensive compared to other sorts of, of things. Plus, you can certainly hurt a patient in a VR scenario and uh, not feel bad about that when you hurt a patient in real life, then we're talking about a different situation, right? Yeah, I think that's really true, Mike. Definitely. Okay, well, I think we're going to be able to get into some of this in more detail in the Q&A, but I thought we'd go ahead and move on and just say, you know, I just want to take a moment to say how exciting it has been for us at the American Academy of Pediatrics to partner with Health Scholars, because we've done pediatric education for a long time. We've done things in print. We've done things online. Uh, we've done in-person courses. But this is really our first foray into VR. And it's just been so exciting to be able to expand into another modality um, that involves even more of the senses and has all of the flexibility that we've talked about today. Um, I just think that it has so much to offer and we're excited to really see where this will go. So that's just a little shout out to Health Scholars to say thank you. But I wanna, I wanna hear from the audience again. So when you think about all you've heard today from Brian and Mike and I, and you think about VR, what kind of VR experiences do you think would be helpful for your organization? And we already had one person mention in the chat about um, some of the, the skills needed in a skilled nursing facility. But I'd love to see if any of the ones on this list also resonate with you. So pediatric training, of course, which we've already talked about today, labor and delivery training, operating room training, resuscitation training, trauma, stroke, and empathy. What do you think? While you're inputting your answers, I'm just going to highlight a comment that we got in the, in the Q&A from Julie Frain, who said, practice makes perfect and decreases the stress of a pediatric emergency. High frequency learning is what's needed to build our confidence. We as pediatric RNs often miss out on mock codes, especially on the night shift. Isn't that the truth? And I really think that points to that flexibility of VR, not just in the specific categories of training, but just all around in terms of the timing and being able to offer that experience to everybody. So let's see what the most popular topical areas of training were for people. Okay, resuscitation. Yep, that's always a nail biter, huh? So lots of people are looking for resuscitation training um, through VR. Also looking at pediatrics, again, as we've talked about, I think for many people who don't do exclusively pediatrics, that's always something that uh, gets people going. But even for those of us who do specialize in pediatrics, it's always great to have extra practice just to kind of lower that, uh, the, the nervousness you feel when you enter into an emergency situation. And really we have a nice spread across all of the other topical areas, which I think is really exciting to see. 
And the empathy training is something that's really emerging now. I think it's really exciting to think about VR as a tool for building some of those skills that are more emotional and social and giving people experiences where they can practice some of those tough situations. So, so many different options and perspectives. So you've heard a little bit from us about what some of the statistics are, what some of the experiences from the field have been. Of course, there's a lot more to learn if you go to the website at healthscholars.com. But I wanna go to some of the specific questions in the chat that are really great. I'm gonna start off uh, with one of the really tough ones uh, that goes to you, Brian. Somebody asked, Vincent Wong, said, how can VR training compensate for the lack of tactile responses from a physical mannequin? What do you no, think about okay. that? No, okay. Great. Um, yeah, Vincent, that, that, that's, that's a, a great question. I see this in two different um, ways. So uh, largely, I, I very much see the benefits of VR being leveraged against cog the cognitive uh, decision-making process. So being truly present, more so than the psychomotor aspects of training. Uh, the majority of our medical errors and patient safety risks orient around the early identification and then correct decision-making with regard to management, far more so than the psycho a psychomotor um, challenge in doing a a, a procedure, just when you look at the, the gamut of, of medical errors. So with, in that regard, virtual reality is leveraged without tactile feedback or haptic feedback for, for the cognitive decision-making process. The, um, now, then the, the other part of the answer is that there, there are a handful of companies that are providing virtual reality um, procedural training. And there um, is not a haptic feedback. There was an interesting, which is just, that's not the kind of um, training that we provide at Health Scholars, but there was an interesting study done uh, probably like eight or nine years ago after a laparoscopic virtual reality trainer um, became introduced into market to identify whether or not the haptics actually added to the the overall competencies of the um, of the of these surgical residents providing uh, from for which it was providing training. Interestingly, the haptics in uh, increased enjoyment, but and satisfaction of the experience, but did not affect the um, proficiency in real life operations. So it kind of you know, begs the question with regard to whether or not it's it's useful. Um, I primarily am oriented around leveraging VR for high stakes, low occurrence clinical managements and the early identification and decision making around those cases. Um, and yeah, and so that's that's sort of a long winded answer, um, but ho hopefully that that adds some some um, shed some light on the on the topic. Sure. You know, we had one comment uh, in the chat that said, we need to bring in the gamers to make more realistic VR software programs, you know, which kind of gets to the, that issue about haptics and, um, and fidelity there. What, what do you think about that? Do we need gamers to write these programs? Okay. I'll, I'll tell you, um, interestingly, at Health Scholars, we pride ourselves maybe a little bit too much so on on fidelity and visual quality. And our entire team are all <laughs> gamers that have left the industry to uh, do something, use their skills in a more kind of, to try to impart like a, their mark on the world and provide some positive impact. But we, we take quality very seriously. That said, my computer's yeah. perspective, um, I've heard you know from others that like really it's the decision making and the opportunity to practice in a real enough um, to life environment. How, how do you see it, Mike? Yeah, I, I mean, this uh, it's amazing to me. You know, you look at um, the Oculus headset, which was like just shy of a thousand dollars when it first came out, and that thing is you know a third the cost now. 
and uh, HP it just came out with a VR headset, or I don't know if it's on the market yet or not, but the HP headset that's used for VR, the Omnicept, is going to monitor your pulse rate from the back of your head, you know, using your paravertebral arteries, and it's going to look at where your eyes are focused and allow a developer to say, um, hey, you were uh, fighting this fire and you weren't looking at the piece that we really think you should be looking at. Um, and, oh, boy, when we put this pediatric case in front of you, your heart rate doubled. Um, so, obviously, you you were excited, you know, when you were managing that. So, I mean, I see VR, the haptics, and, and some of the things that we're talking about, which, like today, we would probably say are more AR, like augmented reality. Um, but I see VR list continuing to evolve to the degree where, um, I'll bet you that at some point soon, it, it's going to come very close to to the experience that you'd have when you're actually in a real simulation with a mannequin. You know, it's just so much of that technology is evolving. And I, I have to say, when you think about the the skills-based piece, like let's take, for example, a pediatric resuscitation. Um, you're a physician and you're a paramedic who's managing that resuscitation. Um, are, we, are we trying to test your ability to put in an IO or, you know, stick a tube in the right place? Or are we looking at your critical thinking ability? And the way that VR is, is helping us right now to teach and helping us to learn is really putting everything together and saying, if you can stand there and you can talk through this situation and tell other people what to do, well, then you're a really good leader. You have good team skills and you have the ability to critically think through the situation. And, I, and some of the other pieces I think are coming later that allow us to delve into the technical aspects of that. But um, right now I see it more as like, this is a piece that tests critical thinking, which is what we're so concerned about in, in, uh, in the competency of our providers. Yeah, that's true. There are a lot of questions uh, in the chat that are get down to, to the nuts and bolts. Folks who are clearly already convinced that VR is going to be a great tool for them and they want to know, how do I get it? How much does it cost? When are you going to come to my area? Um, all great questions. So I wonder if you could just you know jump in on some of those, Brian, because I know you, you've sort of got some of the, the secrets. And I don't know if you can say this in a live broadcast, but that question about what you know, are there any programs coming for skilled nursing facilities, you know, might be interesting to some people. Yeah, no, absolutely. So there are a, a handful of uh, virtual reality um, vendors that are increasing in number um, with regard to providing healthcare training. I um, would love to capture folks um, if you just leave your emails in the in the chat, our team will 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 reach out to you and and speak to you know how you know how can our solutions perhaps add value at your organizations. In general, the the cost of a virtual reality headset um, can be under like three hundred dollars. So so we at Health Scholars currently releases uh, our applications on just the Android platform. Platform, which is the current platform used by all headsets, uh, where we've moved over to the untethered headset, so, so it's wireless. Uh, a VR a Qu Oculus Quest 2 will cost uh, just about $300. Um, and, and then the uh, cost models for virtual reality programs just vary ac across the across providers. We we provide a subscription service, um, to, and it, deliberate practice is super important to, to us. It's con con continuous competency and the ability to repeat your training as often as you need to deliberate practice is at the core of our mission. So health scholars will provide. Um, just unlimited access per learner to that headset. So to try to promote continuous competencies, I think the models just vary depending on the the company. Um, what's in store uh, in the future in terms of trainings? Well, Health Scholars currently is building content across a perioperative 
adult and pediatric resuscitation and high-risk obstetrics uh, content verticals. There's a handful uh, of companies that do provide tactile, um, more psychomotor type of oriented trainings. Um, are we specifically working towards home care? Um, we don't have or, uh, we don't have that on our roadmap at present, but we will always we, uh, develop content in partnership with thought leaders and other organizations. We never want to. We never develop content in a, in a silo. So certainly, if there is any uh, trainings that would be valuable for your organization that currently is not, you know, evangelized out on our on our website, please reach out to us. We're always we're always working with other with healthcare organizations as well as the professional societies to develop new content against the need. Great, thanks. There's another kind of nuts and bolts question, but I think it would be interesting to hear from you, Mike, about how does the team environment work with VR? And somebody had pointed out in the chat also that this is such a great option um, during this period of the pandemic. We didn't even highlight that, but it, it kind of comes into play about how teams can practice and work together, um, either in person or virtually. But can you say a little more about how teams work in VR? Yeah, um, and you know, I probably should have um, talked about that a little bit more in the beginning, but you would think when you put a VR headset on and you proceed to do a simulation that you're uh, by yourself doing that. But in reality, uh, when you walk into a, um, let me just take a resuscitation, for example. Um, no one does a resuscitation all by themselves. They have a whole group of people that are working with them. And you know what breaks down most often that gets us in trouble is communication. So from the very beginning in these scenarios, you need to communicate with each one of the team members and call them by name and address them with what you want them to do and use closed loop communications where they respond to you just like they respond to you in a textbook and say, when you give an order for something, the person is supposed to repeat it back so that you're clear that they understood what you were saying. And that ability to work with the team and to direct people to do different tasks. Um, I, I try to mess with it sometimes when I'm uh, doing a scenario and tell somebody, uh, like for example, who's assigned to give medications to do chest compressions. And, and they tell me that's not my role <laughs> in this scenario. You should be talking to Juan because that's his job. And so, it, it really is, um, it, it incorporates communications and it incorporates teamwork. And if you can't do those or you have weaknesses in those areas, uh, that's identified as, as part of the VR sim. It's not just you against the, the world when you're in there, you're working with other people who are characters um, or avatars in the simulation itself. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can add just a tiny bit of color there very, very briefly. So there are um, multiplayer platforms for virtual reality where one can step into the headset and join their, their colleagues around a, um, a patient. These, I, I very much am interested in solving for the problems of scale and repeatability and, re and, and, solving for the bottleneck that administrative constraints place on trainings or, or on the plasticity of training. So we very much at Health Scholars orient our apps around individualized deliberate practice so that one can step into a headset anytime as often as, as needed uh, without the constraints of having to only do so when a team is available or a facilitator is available. That said, there, there are uh, platforms where you can do multiplayer trainings. Um, I think there's a role for that. And to Mike's point, in the in the very near future, we'll see ourselves, our actual faces, um, using this kind of fancy term called photogrammetry, integrated into VR, where you actually will see one's facial expressions and icon and, and 
and whether or not you're making eye contact. I think until we get to that level of fidelity with regard to multiplayer, I feel that team-based management is probably still best done together in person, whereas this individualized, deliberate practice and repeated training to develop your cognitive and critical thinking competencies is um, best leverage for, for virtual reality. Yeah. One of the things you know, that... I think so. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry about that. Sorry about One that. of the things we didn't really talk about too much um, uh, earlier is like, who is a good champion um, to get this sort of, uh, you know, to use VR in your in your system? Like, who's a good champion in the hospital? Who's a good champion in the pre-hospital environment? And I, to me, um, in the pre-hospital environment, the same people that champion sim uh, are champions for VR. They, they um, struggle with SIM, they look at VR and they're like, wow, uh, this, this answers a lot of my problems, um, less expensively, a little bit more consistently, and uh, a little bit more, uh, less um, operator supervisor dependent and, and more dependent on the user. Um, and I don't know, what, what would you say in the hospital, Jenna or Brian, would, who, who do you think are champions of, of VR? Well, you know what I would say about champions? I mean, this is just a great example, even looking in the chat. I think champions can come from the places you least expect it. I mean, we've got folks here talking about, are you going to bring a program for dentistry? Are you going to bring, bring a program for charting? I mean, I think that's what's so magical about VR is that um, people who are creative thinkers start to see it as, as a tool you can use in so many different kinds of settings that really, you know, the sky's the limit. I don't know, Brian, did you have anything else you wanted to say about that? Yeah, no, it, it's critical that there is a champion in order to make, in order to leverage it, this type of technology in general, any technology and in, in, at least in the health system side of, of training is it, it just sits in the closet unless there's a champion. So um, we find that on the health system side, the um, clinical the nurse clinical education leaders champion VR training as well as the current simulation um, leaders and educationalists in the health system. That's, I do, you know, this reminds me of an important point. In order to roll out virtual reality training, um, there does, we still do want to, some sort of management system it's far less resource intensive than managing um, an in-person mannequin based type of program, but it's still helpful to have capabilities for assigning um, a, a VR exercise to a group of learners to allocate the availability and location of headsets in your, in your, at your organization, um, be it pre-hospital or, or a hospital side of things. And um, an ability for learners to to, to sign up and read and schedule some time on the VR headset, unless your organization, some organizations are actually providing headsets out to all of their learners. Um, oh, at Health Scholars, we've we've developed a, a backend system um, to to enable large scale rollouts of VR, and would be happy, you know, um, after this this webinar to for our team to reach back out to you. Uh, we do have a newsletter that you can sign up for that relates a lot of these types and responses and answers to a lot of the questions that I'm seeing in, in this chat here. Uh, you can go to healthscholars.com and just sign up for the newsletter. That's a great way to uh, also receive information. That's great. And if you can just comment a little bit more on how you reach learners and systems. I know people are asking, do you subscribe? Do you only work with hospitals? But you know, who is the audience um, that Health Scholars is going to reach and how do they do it? For with regard to um, management systems, like for self-scheduling, allocating VR, that sort of thing? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. So 
We there's a number of of frameworks that, that exist already in your organization around scheduling learners for various activities. And usually I found that a, a vast majority of these start to fall apart when you when you end up scaling to large learner populations. So we've implemented a, a, um, a an online system where an administrator will ident will allocate a VR headset, one or more VR headsets to a specific room. And in, in health systems, a lot of times there are conference rooms um, that that need that where a headset will need to actually kind of rotate between based on availability of that room. And then we also are very attentive around reaching night staff. As, as one of the um, audience members you know, commented it also that night staff is often underrepresented in training. So we've developed a system where an administrator can allocate space and time for a headset and then a, um, an assignment type of manager where one will um, assign a, a VR curriculum, a handful of scenarios you know, that are relevant to a learner population due at some interval. So maybe it's due in, in the next, um, at the end of quarter, then it, learners will be able to self register, self schedule themselves on a, on a headset for a specific time so that they don't show up to the, the, the nursing station or the conference room or the simulation space and, and find that someone else is already on the headset. So some management system is, is useful. It's going to be really important. Um, the beautiful thing about virtual reality, in, in my perspective, in, in this domain, is that it can be entirely automated. The, the entire learning experience can be self-directed, as well as um, automating the administrative aspects. So we've taken that whole administrative paradigm and put it into software as a so that this now becomes like a process automation tool. So there's been virtually very little to no know overhead. That's how we do it at Health Scholars. Yeah, that's great. And I know there will be opportunities uh, for us to connect after this session today for those who have more specific questions about how do I get it where I am. Um, and obviously, if you go to healthscholars.com, you'll find more specifics there. But we have to wrap up, but I want to take just a second um, to ask you to think out into the future. There's a question in there about how far are we away from full immersion? We know technology is changing quickly. Can the software keep up and sort of what does the future look like for VR? So, Brian, put your visionary hat on for us and let us know where we're headed. Okay. So... I see us heading towards holograms. <laughs> That's the geeky side of me. But um, ver so today we're seeing a massive growth in the virtual reality technology industry. Um, there is a significant amount of technology oriented around capturing our facial expressions with inward facing cameras, as well as haptic outfits. Uh, at Health Scholars, we've experimented with haptic gloves, for example, for, for force feedback. So this technology is rapidly accelerating. Um, I do see a budding industry in holographic technology. Um, I think you're going to see that probably in about a decade from now. <laughs> awesome. Holograms are so exciting. I'm ready. I'm ready to see it. This has been so much fun today to chat with you, Mike and Brian, and um, I'm just so excited to see what the future holds for VR. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Melanie, to take us home. We might have lost Melanie's audio. Maybe Melanie's not going to take us home. Maybe we'll just do it ourselves. <laughs> but like I said, I think it's been really awesome conversation today. So glad to see so many people here to participate. A uh, hundred folks, you know, over a hundred people have joined us. And we're excited to continue the dialogue and the conversation with you through all of the resources we've shared with you today. So thanks for coming, everybody. Take care. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.